guest is a superstar in the field of integrative gastroenterology. And the reason I'm wearing a hat is because the right before the broadcast, I was listening to one of her podcasts and she was talking about how we just over sanitize. And I got so afraid to take a shower that I figured I'll just wear a hat today, but I'm sure she'll talk a lot about that. I first heard about her when I listened to her amazing interview on the Rich Roll podcast several years ago. And if you watch the Dr. Oz show, she is a regular on that show. She's written many best selling books, including Gut Bliss, The Microbiome Solution, and The Bloat Cure. Please welcome to the show, Dr. Robin Chutkin. I am so happy to meet you. Hi, everyone. Chef AJ, thank you so much for having me. I just can't believe right before the show, you told me what a small world it is that I guess I recently had on Dr. Janice Lester. You, you trained her. She was my GI fellow at Georgetown, and she was spectacular. I remember the first day I met her. And as I was saying, I'm so proud of her because she has really taken her time to figure out what it is she wants to do. She's opening up this new practice in just a few weeks, and we're so excited for her here in D.C. And that's so great. You're in the same town. You know, I've recently interviewed quite a few gastroenterologists because I'm doing something, I'm hosting something called the GI Health Summit. And it, it, there's, there's something about your specialty. You guys just seem to be so passionate about the gut. It's incredible. Well, you know, in medical school, all the glamorous professions are things like dermatology and neurosurgery. And so, you know, you have to have a certain appetite for getting a little bit dirty to like gastroenterology. So I think it's a bonding experience, all of us who enjoy mucking around at the colon. Yeah, and you guys aren't afraid to talk about poop, which is awesome because people are uh, people are. No, well, our goal is to get it out of the closet, out of the water closet, to get the toilet out of the water closet and to the dinner table. Oh, that is so cool. How, how did you first get interested in GI health? So my dad is an orthopedic surgeon and my brother's an orthopedic surgeon. And I thought, right, I'm going to be an orthopedic surgeon. And AJ literally within about mm, 13 minutes of my orthopedic surgery rotation, I realized this is carpentry and no disrespect to my orthopedic surgeons out there, but it really wasn't for me. So then I thought maybe general surgery. I like things, the diagnostic part of things with procedures and so on and narrowed it down to gastroenterology. Oh, that's amazing. I, I just, I love, I love your work so much. And, and the bloat cure is, that's such a great book because that is the number one thing I hear about people when they're saying, well, I can't be on a plant-based diet because I'm bloated, you know? Yeah. Yeah, and you know, it, it's so interesting because all of these things, bloating, reflux, constipation, it's all our body giving us feedback. And the conventional medical community says, ignore that, take a pill, you'll be fine. And so for me, the real impetus behind writing the books is I want to re-empower people and I want them to understand how their GI tract works and what they can do to make it sort of, you know, turn it into that well-oiled machine. But even more importantly, to understand when they're getting that negative feedback, whether it's heartburn, whether it's bloating, whatever it is, to really look for the root cause and say, okay, what am I doing? Or sometimes what am I not doing? And of course that all revolves around not eating enough plants usually, but what am I doing or not doing? Why my GI tract isn't functioning properly. And AJ, if you think about where the gut is located, it's right in the center of the body. It is literally the engine for our entire body. And you know, you think about all the other organs as spokes coming out from that wheel. So the brain and the heart and the lungs and the kidneys, they're all peripheral to the gut. So if you don't get things right in the gut, if your engine isn't running properly, it's very difficult to imagine that the rest of the organs are going to really be peak performance. Yeah, that, that's what I'm learning, that, that, she, that health starts in the gut. Hippocrates said it first. Well, he said all disease begins in the gut, but it stands to reason that good health begins there too, for sure. And, and to, you know, to go back to the, what I was talking about, about medical school, the gut is having a moment. Because I'll tell you, when I finished medical school in uh, way back in, my goodness, 1991, GI was not considered an exciting profession at all. It was, you know, pancreatic disease and colon cancer and diverticulosis and things that often affected sort of an elderly population. But people are realizing with the advent of the microbiome and people are understanding things like leaky gut, et cetera, and just how inflammation in the gut in general can have such a profound influence on the rest of the body. So AJ, if we look in the last decade, we see now a connection between diseases like Parkinson's disease, coronary artery disease, depression and anxiety. I mean, the list of diseases that we can link back to what is happening in the gut and specifically the health of the microbiome is just astounding. So for me, it, it's created incredible excitement within the profession, realizing that it's not just about treating patients with Crohn's or colitis, as rewarding as that is, but you can actually help people to improve their mood disorders and decrease their chances of developing diabetes and heart disease. And that's truly exciting. 
I love how you say three things are so important. Uh, sweat, getting dirty, and plants. Yes, I, I've officially dirt, sweat, veg. And it's funny because people at this point, we do have a fair amount of patients who come from out of town. And sometimes I think people must be so disappointed. You know, they fly in from New Mexico or wherever. And I'm, I'm just thinking to myself, how can I make dirt, sweat and vegetables sexier and seem, you know, more medical and exciting? But so much of it boils down to that. We've got to get outside in nature. That's where we get most of our microbes. We've got to get sweaty because it's just good for our body. It's sort of the ultimate detox, sweating and getting your heart rate up. And then we've got to eat more vegetables. And of course there's some more nuances to that, but you know, that covers a lot of ground in terms of how do we stay healthy? I think this is very timely because with the age of COVID people are over sanitizing and you, you actually have a recipe on your website to make your own hand sanitizer, but you're saying that sometimes we're just too clean. Absolutely. And it has really sort of created a bit of a conundrum, AJ, because obviously during a pandemic, all bets are off. Please wash your hands for sure. But if you think about how we got to this place of 50 million Americans with autoimmune diseases, uh, almost one in four people, we, there's a direct link between the super sanitization and the onset of these autoimmune diseases. So some of our listeners uh, will know about something called the hygiene hypothesis which is when David Strawn, who was a researcher at the London School of Tropical Medicine and Hygiene, was tasked in the 1950s in London with trying to figure out why they were seeing this incredible surge in kids who had autoimmune disease, and two in particular, hay fever, which is like asthma, and eczema. And this happened right in sort of post-industrial London. So what happened around that time? Well, everybody moved from the farm to the factory. So they were in the big, sort of in the midst of the industrial age. And they were seeing these skyrocketing rates of these autoimmune diseases in kids. So David Strawn embarked on an almost 30 year study, looked at 21,000 kids from birth to adulthood. And what he found two really amazing things that completely turned what we thought we knew about cleanliness and disease and the relationship between the two, turned it on its head. Number one, kids who came from large households where they had lots of siblings who were coughing and sneezing on them and making them sick, they had low rates of autoimmune disease. It was actually good to be exposed to a lot of those germs early on. It strengthened their immune system and it trained their immune system. And the second thing he found was that kids who came from very affluent households who were bathing a lot, and of course, affluence is not associated with cleanliness in, anymore, but at the time in 1950s London, it was because affluent kids had access to bathrooms and showers and so on. So the kids who were bathing all the time and were super clean, they were the ones getting all the autoimmune diseases. So this idea of being super sanitized, it's actually creating disease. We need exposure to those germs to train our immune system and so that we can have a nice rich microbiome that's full of lots of species. It's so interesting because when you think back in the day, there was a doctor named Semmelweis who, you know, we basically told people you have to wash your hands. We went from people not doing that to like overdoing that. Yeah, well, you know, some basic hand washing is good, but I'm glad you mentioned the hand washing because what a lot of people don't realize is that many of those antibacterial hand sanitizers, they're antibacterial, but they're not antiviral. And the best way to protect yourself is to just use a uh, regular soap, warm water, rub your hands together, you know, get all in between the fingers and so on for about as long as it takes to sing two verses of happy birthday, because that's what dislodges the viral particles that can be between the hands and in the palm, etc. So if you're out on the road and you don't have access to that, some hand sanitizer is fine. But if you're at home, hand washing with soap and water works just fine. And it doesn't have to be some super strong soap, just a regular mild soap is fine. Isn't it interesting though, when the pandemic started, that's what, that's what we ran out of first in the stores. Yeah, that is really telling, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. You know, I, I keep going back to the, okay, dirt, sweat, veg. I have a friend that designs t-shirts. I, I think that'd be a great t-shirt oh, for you. Yeah. Let's make some. Actually, I'm going to make you one. So what's your favorite color? I'm, I'm guessing it's blue because you look great in blue. But I don't know for sure. <laughs> I'll take it in any color. Maybe okay. we should have like a brown Oh, blue yeah. and then the green. No, but I'm really going to do it. I have a, a friend who's a graphic artist that designs it. I, I just think that'd be so perfect. And then with your website on the back. So that would be really fun. Uh, Lisa, who's watching live, says Dr. Chutkin is a great guest. Amazing credentials. Yes. And, and I'm just, I'm so honored to, to actually have her on my show. So thank you. So what, what, how, you know, with COVID, 
how is it affecting people with GI disease? Are, you know, because we know that like a lot of the doctors I've had on, like Dr. Katz and Dr. Willett were saying that people that have other comorbidities, like for example, obesity or diabetes, they're maybe not going to fare as well. But what if somebody with pre-existing GI conditions, is there any evidence that that's not a great thing for right now? Yeah, you know, the good news, AJ, is that the probably the commonest GI condition other than mild constipation, et cetera, is something called IBS, irritable bowel syndrome, affects somewhere around one in four Americans. And irritable bowel syndrome does not seem to confer any increased risk for COVID-19, which is great. But inflammatory bowel disease, IBD, which people sometimes confuse with IBS, even though they're completely different, inflammatory bowel disease, which consists of two diseases, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis, that does confer an increased risk primarily through the medications that people are on. So if you are a patient out there with Crohn's or ulcerative colitis and you are under 65 and you are otherwise in good health and you are not taking an immunosuppressive drug like a steroid or a biologic, those drugs you see advertised on TV, then you're in pretty good shape. But if you are on one of those drugs, then that's really what confers the increased risk. So it's not the disease itself. And particularly if you're in remission, and one of the great joys I have in my medical practice is helping patients with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis get into remission primarily with using a plant-based diet and some other tricks of the trade that we, that we have, we've developed over the years. So for those patients are not at any increased risk, but if you have high level of disease activity, you're over 65 or you're on an immunosuppressant medication, that can be a problem. And we have a couple of free webinars on the Gupless site about inflammatory bowel disease and COVID. So it's a, a good opportunity to get some more in-depth information. Uh, Karen, who's watching live says, do fermented foods really add probiotics to the gut or is just eating lots of vegetables just as effective? Karen, I'm so glad you asked that because fermented foods are the powerhouse duo of both prebiotic and probiotics. So prebiotics, let, let's just a little bit of definition here. And I know this is a really sophisticated audience, but for those who might not be as familiar with the terminology, a probiotic is a live bacteria that by definition, when ingested, confers a benefit to the host, that's to us. So think of probiotics as live bacteria. Prebiotics are the food that live bacteria eat. And so those would be typically high fiber foods, but also the stringy fiber inulin. So things like raw oats and white beans, dandelion greens, all kinds of fiber stuff. What a fermented food is, is again, it's this powerhouse duo of both pre and probiotics. So let's take sauerkraut, for example, one of the common fermented foods. Sauerkraut's made from cabbage. And in the process of fermenting the cabbage, there's a ton of lactobacillus that's created. So the lactobacillus is the probiotic part, that's the live bacteria. But the cabbage itself, which is a fantastic fibrous food, is the food for the bacteria. So when you eat fermented foods, you're getting both the prebiotic, the fibrous piece, and the live bacteria through the fermentation process. And, and fermented foods are incredibly good. In fact, eating fermented foods regularly, as well as a high fiber diet, probably does way more for you for the average person than taking a store-bought probiotic. Yeah, I, we're actually next Monday on the show, my professor at culinary school is gonna be doing a demo teaching us how to make our own sauerkraut. So that should well, be I nice. Watch, I am such a bad fermenter. And it's because my daughter, who's a very good cook, who's 15, she's like, mommy, it's an exact science. You don't fudge this. It's an exact science. Cooking is an exact science. Because I'm always like, oh, I'll just throw in a little bit of this. And then my sauerkraut comes out with like mold on it. So I'm definitely going to tune in to watch it. Next Monday, did you say? Yeah, Monday at 11 o'clock, Elena Love. And uh, yeah, she's going to be, I can't wait. I've, I've done it once. It's, it, you know, once you, it's not that labor intensive. You just have to be patient. It just, it's so, but it, it's kind and of fun. follow the directions. You yeah, absolutely. The so get out, get your mason jars now, guys, because you're definitely going to need those. Bonnie asks, what are the links between gut health and skin related fungal infections like tinea, if mm. there is one? Yeah, there is a, a huge connection there. So what I want you to remember is that when we talk about the microbiome, we're not just talking about the gut. Of course, that is where the majority of the 100 trillion microbes are located. They're mostly in the gut, but they're all over our body. They're on our scalp and our skin, and they really differ based on the location. So for example, the bacteria in my nasal labial fold here, where there's a crease, completely different from the bacteria an inch up on my cheek based on the moisture and the oxygen levels and the slight difference in temperature, et cetera. So the skin has a very distinct ecosystem. 
normally, just like the gut, normally if you have a balanced microbiome, you can tolerate a couple of parasites here and there, a fungal infection, et cetera, because everything lives somewhat symbiotically. And even yeast in the gut, yeast actually play a really important role in digestion. It's when they overgrow. So let's go through what happens when you take a course of broad spectrum antibiotics. So you get put on Cipro, a Z-Pak, any one of these broad spectrum antibodies. Within about five to seven days, a third of your microbial ecosystem can be wiped out. And unfortunately, it's those fragile essential microbes that get killed off first. Now they don't just get killed off in the gut, they get killed off in the reproductive tract, which is why women end up with things like bacterial vaginosis and yeast infections because it's not that you contract a yeast infection, it's that low levels of yeast that are normally present now start to overgrow and now they're misrepresented. And it's the same things with things like tinea, ringworm, things like that. They're often present in very low levels in our body, but when our sort of peacekeeper healthy bacteria are killed off, now they overgrow. And one of the common mistakes that I think people make, whether it's treating a fungal infection or bacterial vaginosis, is they think in terms of germ theory. Pasteur's germ theory says, you have a bad bug and you gotta kill it and destroy it. I like to think in terms of what I call terrain theory, which is your terrain is unhealthy. You've got too many weeds. You've got to increase the amount of healthy bacteria and you've got to drown out the bad stuff. Because I see so many patients, AJ, who come in and they are on massive antifungals. I'm like, I'm surprised your liver is still functioning with the amount of antifungals you've been taking for years. And they still can't seem to get better. And it's because what's happened is that they haven't really worked hard enough to repopulate the microbiome with healthy species. So I really focus on repopulation as opposed to eradication. And you can get rid of that tinea and that athlete's foot and all the rest by really increasing the population of healthy bacteria. Nice. Okay. Is there, uh, Donna says, is there any connection between gut bacteria and lichen sclerosis? That's such an interesting question. I have a patient in my practice who has lichen, lichen, I say lichen sclerosis, who has it vaginally. And as you can imagine, it creates a lot of problems in the bedroom because it creates a lot of dryness and itching and pain and so on. And I think, and I don't have any proof because I'm not an expert in this, but I think hers developed because she was using, it got worse, she was using so much steroid cream on it that it really kind of destroyed the bacterial ecosystem in the area. And again, it's just an association. I'm not an expert, full disclaimer, but I wonder if overuse of antibacterials, antibiotics uh, and steroids, where you really destroy the microbiome can cause this kind of sclerotic reaction. If we think about rosacea, that's one of the causes in some people. So people who have used a lot of antibiotics for acne when they were younger, whether topical or orally, they destroy the micro, the ecoflora, uh, the ecosystem on the skin, and then they're left with rosacea. And so I think for a lot of these conditions, there is a potential contribution of not having a healthy ecosystem and so for my rosacea patients who usually come to me because they have small intestinal bacterial overgrowth, they have SIBO or they have leaky gut or something, but I'm always fascinated with the gut skin connection. So I tell them, listen, we're also going to work on your rosacea. And the first thing I want you to do, stop washing your face. Just stop. Let that healthy bacteria flourish. Because often they're using all these different potions and they're using Metrogel and they're just decimating the microbiome of their skin. So it's, you know, sort of like you with the hair this morning that you said, I'm not going to wash my hair. I mean, for a lot of people, they're like, what do you mean don't wash your face? But often these conditions are not caused because our skin is dirty. They're caused because our skin is too clean and we've wiped away the healthy microbes. So if anybody's out there struggling with rosacea, acne, eczema, I want you to give it a try. Just stop washing, you know, a little bit of rinsing. Yeah. Yeah, because Jeannie says, how do we improve the ecosystem of the skin? Maybe just not by overwashing it, like you're saying. And, and I'm wondering, because I, I don't, try, I try not to wear a lot of makeup, but I do wear a little and I'm thinking, maybe that's not good. So we improve it with dark sweat and veg. Yes. We improve it with getting out into nature and, you know, ideally even playing in a little bit of the dirt. And we know that the trees emit essential oils, which are really important for our health. So we improve it by getting out into nature. 
We improve it by detoxifying our bodies through exercise and through eating more vegetables. And again, I, you know, I try and make it fancier. And this is not to say that dirt, sweat, and vegetables are going to cure lichen sclerosis, but really exposure to nature, cutting down on a lot of the personal products that are filled with chemicals and really trying to rehab our microbiome through diet and eating more plants. I, you know, when, you, when you're using a face wash or something, I want you to really take a look at that bottle and turn it around and start to read those ingredients. And really it sounds like a chemistry lab. It's not supposed to sound like that. I personally use Manuka honey on my face to wash it when I do wash it, mostly just water but uh, a little bit of Manuka honey and that works great because I have rosacea and the Manuka honey is very mild and you know, literally the same Manuka honey you would eat. And I just dab my face and rub it on there. And that's how really helped me with the rosacea. Right. And I, I switched to a company that's literally made of plants, like the ingredients are things like blueberries and peaches and th like th th things oh. you could put in your mouth. Is that Tata Harper? I just have to add. One is called Body Deli and it's a local company and I've had them on the show and one is called Kaylin Harwell Skincare and literally I've actually eaten their product on the air to show that like it's- oh, I love that. Yeah, yeah. It it I mean, that is the ultimate bar, right? Because our skin after our GI tract is our second largest digestive organ. I mean, notice what happens when you put on makeup in the morning and by, you know, six o'clock, it's sort of gone. Like, where does it go? Our skin literally ate it. That's funny, where does it go? <laughs> to go so if you are putting stuff on that you wouldn't eat that really should be the bar i love that you were eating those products on the show you go back and look at that one <laughs> yeah and i realize i'm very guilty of sometimes not taking my makeup off <laughs> not good <coughs> excuse me okay so dr woodruff says how does resistant starch help the microbiome Resistant starch is one of the types of fibers that don't get absorbed higher up in the small intestine. That's why they call it resistant. It's resistant to digestion. And so it travels further down in the intestine and it gets fermented by gut bacteria to a really important type of compound, which is called a short chain fatty acids. So you've probably heard of things like butyrate and propionate, et cetera. Those short chain fatty acids are a really important marker of gut health. The higher the levels of short chain fatty acids, the healthier the gut is. And so those resistant starches help to generate short chain fatty acids that keep the gut lining healthy. And there was a really fascinating study that was done um, by an Italian researcher named Paolo Leonetti several years ago. And he looked at the diet in breastfed, vaginally born newborns, because of course we know there are big, big differences in vaginally born versus C-section and breastfed versus not. And you can imagine which one is healthier. So he looked at kids in Florence, Italy and kids in Bullpon, Burkina Faso in Africa who were breastfed and vaginally born. And he found that as newborns, the microbiomes were essentially the same. But as soon as those kids graduated to the local diet, to table food, everything changed. So the kids in Florence, Italy were eating a sort of Western diet. So gelato, pizza, ossobuco, a lot of animal protein and animal fat and sugar. The kids in Burkina Faso were eating a plant-based diet, root vegetables, lots of resistant starches and what we call microbiota accessible carbohydrates, max. And they were eating an occasional termite for animal protein and you know, free range chicken every couple months, but it was a, primarily a plant-based diet. AJ, the microbiomes could not have been more different. So the kids were eating the high resistant starches. They had double the levels of short chain fatty acids. They had all the microbes associated with leanness the Italian kids had all the microbes associated with diarrheal disease and with obesity. But what's really fascinating is neither group of kids were sick. These are healthy toddlers, but you could already see the microbial changes that were setting up the meat and fat eaters, were setting them up for disease down the road, setting them up for inflammatory bowel disease and diverticulosis and all the rest. And the kids in Burkina Faso had a microbiome that was keeping them lean and healthy. And so, you know, when you talk about the importance of resistant starches and, you know, I tell you, when I look around, see all these people doing these keto diets and I just feel sick. And, and first of all, they all get super constipated and that's a problem, but it's challenging for a lot of people because they go on those diets and they lose weight and they lose weight quickly. And, you know, for people who've struggled with losing weight, it can be, it can feel like a miracle. 
But not only is it setting you up for heart disease and other cardiometabolic diseases, but it's really bad for your microbiome. You need all those plants, not just the actual green vegetables, but you want some of those whole grains also. You need those microbiota accessible carbohydrates. So you want the legumes, the oats, and all of those things. Eating termites is a new one for me, I'll tell you. You have a lot of books, I just noticed. Oh, yeah, this is this is just a fraction. We have a lot. <laughs> I'm at the point now where we, we actually are having to think about throwing out some books, and it is heartbreaking. I have a bunch more bookshelves downstairs and about 30 boxes, but it's time. It's time, but it, it's really hard for me. Yeah, that's, that's cool. About so a lot of people watching follow a whole food plant-based diet. And the question from Caroline is, is, is something I hear a lot, which is one of the reasons I wanted to do a, a summit. And she said, what if you are following a whole food plant-based diet with at least two pounds of vegetables, including greens daily, and still have bloating and chronic constipation? What could be the cause? I hear this a lot. It's like everybody's bloating. So Caroline, it's important when you think about bloating and constipation to think about it more broadly. So I love the fact that you are paying attention to your diet because that's key. And to some extent, you know, what goes in is a reflection of what comes out. But there are other things that happen along your 30 foot digestive superhighway, for example. Just anatomically, women have longer colons than men. And that's so we can absorb more water during childbirth to keep the amniotic fluid at an adequate level. So that longer colon means more twists and turns. We have a deeper, wider pelvis. So our colon falls low down in the abdomen, really in the pelvis where it has to compete for space with the uterus and the fallopian tubes and the ovaries. And we also have, just because of the differences in hormonal levels between estrogen and testosterone, we don't have an abdominal wall that is as strong as men, even those of us who do a lot of sit-ups, because of lower testosterone levels. So these three factors, Carolyn, the longer colon, the competition for space with the pelvic organs and an abdominal wall that's not as tight predispose us to more constipation and bloating. In addition, you add on the fact that the pelvic floor in some women, particularly as we get older, the pelvic floor is that hammock that everything rests in. So you've got the bladder and the sigmoid colon and the uterus and everything is resting in that pelvic floor. And sometimes it can fall, pelvic floor descent, and you know things are, the uterus tips, and things are all smushed in there. So that can lead to some problems with constipation and bloating. You can have uterine fibroids, you can have endometriosis, you can have hypothyroidism, you could be taking a supplement with iron in it that's causing you to be constipated and bloated. There are so many different things, but I don't want you to give up hope. I mean, you're doing the two pounds of vegetables, like do not stop doing that. If you're out there and you find that when you eat a lot of vegetables, particularly cruciferous vegetables, that you're very bloated, that's a good time to think about taking a digestive enzyme that might help to break down some of that raffinose, that indigestible plant fiber. My friend, Dr. Will Bulsiewicz, Dr. B, I love his book. I have it right over here, um, Fiber Fuel. So he has some great tips. I have to give a shout out to him. He has some great tips in that book about how to manage more of the bloating from the cruciferous vegetables. But if you're looking to do some detective work to find out why you're constipated and bloated despite the diet, I highly recommend my first book, Gutless, or my third book, The Bloat Cure, because The Bloat Cure is 101 causes of bloating from A to Z, and it can help you go through. I mean, some of the things we don't think about, the medicine cabinet can be, you know, sometimes it's a menace cabinet, as I like to call it. And sometimes you're taking supplements, so you don't even realize they have things in there that can be messing you up. Great. Thank you. Lynn says, I heard that digestive things like Tums can wipe out gut bacteria. Is this true? Tums, not so much, but I, I'm glad that you asked that question because it does raise this issue of proton pump inhibitors. And that would be, you know, the little purple pill, Nexium, Prilosec, Pantoprazole, all of those drugs. And in the age of COVID, it's really important for you to know that taking those drugs on a regular basis over a significant period of time, over more than a few months, can double or even triple your risk of getting COVID. And that's because gut bacteria are integrally involved in protecting against viral infections. So when you change the pH of the stomach, normally when you're not taking one of those drugs, the stomach pH is very acidic. And that means that viruses that you might, that might get in through the nose or mouth that are swallowed will be killed off by the acidic pH. 
when you take those drugs and you now remove that acid and you have a nice alkaline pH in the stomach, you now have a very friendly, hospitable environment for not just bacteria to overgrow, but for viral particles to overgrow. So what you might be thinking of is it was on the news a lot in the last month or two is the study that showed a correlation between taking acid blocking drugs and the risk for COVID, but it was a proton pump inhibitors. Things like Tums are very short acting, so they don't block stomach acid. In fact, they're neutralizing it, mostly things like calcium carbonate. So those are okay to take from time to time. But again, a better approach is to say, okay, why am I having heartburn? What did I do? Did I eat late at night? Did I eat too much? Did I drink too much coffee? Too much dark chocolate? Too much alcohol? Am I eating and then going straight to bed? So again, trying to be a little bit of a medical detective and figure out the root cause for why you're having these symptoms. Great. Thank you. Everybody's asking, do you ever do telemedicine? Can people see you or, or must they live in Washington, DC? No, you know, we, we do do some telemedicine and right now our practice is still physically closed, but the telehealth laws are such that I'm not able to do telemedicine for somebody outside of the state where I'm licensed to practice, which is DC, Maryland, and Virginia. So that, that creates a little bit of um, an obstacle. Yeah. yeah. Wow. That'd be, oh, you, I bet you're an amazing doctor, but they could just go take a trip to Washington, D.C. and then do the consult like from their home. Read, read, if you're interested in microbiome stuff, read the microbiome solution, because my goal is to make myself superfluous. Like, again, I don't think you should need to come and see me. I want you to be able to read the books, change your diet, go for a walk in the woods and be good and not yeah. need me. That's really my goal. I just want to wave at you at the farmer's market or see you on the yoga mat. That was so cool. You, you, you love yoga, don't you? I do. And AJ, I tell you, I'm having such a hard time with my yoga practice because I used to go as a regular at least three times a week at a wonderful local studio called Down Dog Yoga here in DC. And it's heated uh, Baptiste style vinyasa flow yoga. So obviously they're closed in the one in DC. And I'm just having a really hard time settling. I know the flow inside out, but I'm having a hard time really just quieting myself down to do the full practice. I've been playing tennis and running and on the bike and all those fast things, but just really being settled and quiet and getting through the whole practice. And I think it's partly, you know, it's sort of like the anxiety that we all feel. We're all sort of antsy about what's going on in the future and our loved ones. And for me, it's manifesting as having a difficult time getting through my practice. Do you still have Hugo? No. <laughs> no, unfortunately, we don't. We were on a walk. My husband, my daughter, and I were on a walk yesterday, and we saw a dog that looked it was a German short haired pointer, it was a spitting image of Hugo, and he was straining off his leash to come over to us. And we all were like, It's, it's the ghost of Hugo. Aww. Well, because I, I was going to say that my, I have a, I have a little dog and I, I practice yoga at home. I do a type of yoga called yin, but she just loves to do it with me. It's the weirdest thing. It's like she copies me. Whatever I do, she does. It's it's bizarre. I have some photos of it. It's, you, you won't believe it. It's so I'm sorry oh, about that. That's wonderful. What's your doggy's name? Bailey. She's usually here, but I just, this is a guest parents on the <laughs> She usually does, but this was such an important interview. I just didn't want her barking, but she's very cute. Very cute. I just love that. And dogs are good for our microbiome, right? People dogs are like, oh, fantastic. dogs aren't dirty. If dogs were, I, I've been volunteering in hospitals for 30 years doing pet therapy. And if dogs were dirty, they wouldn't let me and Bailey in the yeah. ICU after somebody just had open heart surgery. There are actually clinical studies, AJ, showing that kids who have dogs, require fewer antibiotics, have fewer allergies, fewer asthma attacks, etc. So dogs and kids go hand in hand and, and for adults too. Do and also dogs get you out into nature, ideally, right? You have to take them out to walk them. Absolutely. This is a really interesting question. Uh, my, sorry, this goes really fast. But, uh, from, it is basically about when people have had like gastric bypass surgeries. Oh, here it is from Katie. Does the stomach, gastric bypass or sleeves, how does that affect our gut microbiome? Because you're literally cutting some of it out, right? Yeah, you know, every part of the GI tract is important and serves a different role. And we have what we call specialized epithelium, the lining, the lining in the mouth, which is part of the GI tract is different from the top part of the esophagus, different from the bottom part, the stomach, the duodenum, the jejunum, the ileum, the colon, they all do different things. So for example, the higher part of the small intestine in the duodenum and jejunum 
is where the fat soluble vitamins A, D, E, and K are absorbed. And the higher part is where iron is absorbed. The lower part of the small intestine, the ileum is where B12 is absorbed. So they all do different things. And then the bacterial content changes as we go from north in the mouth, south down to the anus, the amount of bacteria increases so that the lower part of the colon has the highest burden of bacteria. And it's supposed to be that way. So when you start switching things around and cutting out parts and bypassing and moving stuff around, you can really affect nutrient absorption and you can also disrupt the microbiome. So there've been some studies looking at that, but really we're gonna see that in the longitudinal data, looking out at 20 years, 30 years after this kind of surgery, what happens. The good news though, is that we're doing less really aggressive bariatric surgery. A decade ago, you know, they were just taking, removing large parts of the intestine. And those patients often ended up with bad arthritis because of the nutrient deficiencies that you just couldn't overcome with a supplement. So that's not so much in vogue now. Now they're doing things more like sleeves and balloons and so on, and even temporary things where you can inflate a balloon so somebody feels full and doesn't eat as much, and then you can deflate it at a later time. And I think those are much safer in general. Right. And, and your student, Jan Dr. Janice Laster, talked about the procedures she does that are that are reversible. So that wouldn't yes. that, that that's very cool. And I, one of the things I, I love sorry to interrupt. One of the things I love about what she's doing is she is combining it with nutrition. She's not just saying, you know, I'm going to put a balloon in or, you know, I'm going to cut out part of your intestine. She's like, let's really work on your diet, let's work on the obstacles to weight loss, be there, you know, whatever they may be, like what's going on emotionally, et cetera. And then I also have these things to offer you, which I think is a right way to, to sort of combine these more invasive offerings. Right, a lot of comments that your home is beautiful, especially the light <laughs> fixture that's behind you, the Starburst people are saying. So Miriam says, I love your books. Thank you for writing them. I give them to my patients all day long. Quote, don't wash the radishes too much. Don't run dishwasher on high heat. Some bugs are good to keep. Oh, I love that. Thank you so much for that. I didn't realize that the dishwashers even had, I've, I've got to check mine. I didn't know that they had, you could, you could set the different temperatures on your dishwasher. And I'll tell you, <laughs> <laughs> I'm husband somewhere around in the house. He must be laughing when he hears this. I had never used a dishwasher before we got married. I had dishwashers, but I was so distrustful because I'm like, okay, you've got to clean the plate pretty well before you put it in this machine. Why not just clean it all the way? So I use my dishwasher as a drying rack. I literally had never turned it on. And I am convinced that, and I have zero scientific evidence to back this up really, but that this idea that you run the dishes through the dishwasher and then all, you know, there's all this residue of the detergent that it can't possibly be good for us. I say just sort of rinse them and be done, but that, that's a sort of unscientific assessment of what's going on. Yep. Absolutely. Uh, washing dishes before putting them in the dishwasher is like cleaning your house before the cleaning lady comes. <laughs> People like to do that kind of thing. Sharon wants to know if you personally meditate. I do. I do. And um, I tend to do it first thing in the morning and right when I go to bed. And my bedtime meditation usually consists of me mentally going through uh, the entire vinyasa flow sequence, seeing how far I can get. And it just helps me really to get to bed. I've been obsessed with the US Open. I don't know if Serena won her match. I know she was, when we started, they were a set of piece and into the third. So I'm dying to find out. But um, I've been staying up late watching a lot of US Open and I'm sort of revved up often at night when I go to bed, thinking about the match. and. And it really helps me, for me, it's just that mantra of going through, starting with, you know, being in down dog, a couple ohms. I'm just doing it mentally and then running through the whole sequence. It, it just really calms me. And I've been doing that for a long time as my nighttime meditation. Nice, thank you. Georgette said, is kombucha good? I heard that it's not. <laughs> kombucha is better than soda. Uh, kombucha is not a health food because it doesn't have enough live bacteria in it to really confer a health benefit. So there haven't been any studies showing, there's lots of marketing data, but there's no study showing that drinking kombucha is healthy for you. What I will say is that soda is incredibly bad for you. And if you were a heavy soda drinker and now you're enjoying a kombucha once a day, 
I don't think that's super harmful. I don't think it's harmful in any way, but it's not conferring a health benefit. And I think that's important to know. Terrific. David says, is there any science that proves that dairy is a problem for the microbiome? David, that's, it's such a good question and it's such a fraught question, quite frankly. Philosophically, I believe that dairy is for baby cows and, and uh, not for adult people because we're sort of you know suckling a postpartum cow when we're eating dairy. And, and the reason I believe that is that the majority, more than 50% of the world is lactose intolerant. So most adults, and it's higher in certain ethnic groups, as you know, but most adults, more than 50%, will lose their ability. That enzyme, lactase, that's in the brush border of the small intestine, will eventually disappear, and we will develop some degree of lactose intolerance. And I, intolerance. And I believe because physiologically, we're not designed to keep eating this. Remember that dairy is a substance made mostly of simple sugars. It is designed to get a little baby cow to grow to a very big cow fast. And so it is a food that is typically high in fat and high in sugar. And when you artificially try and make it low fat and take the sugar out and so on, you create a synthetic compound. So now you've created sort of a Franken food, right? Low fat dairy and things like that, low fat yogurt, because you've had, you've had to artificially, synthetically create a new substance. And so it's not the natural dairy that is coming out of the animal. So I don't think that's good either. Um, the studies about dairy being bad for the microbiome specifically, there's not a lot of convincing evidence for that. But there is convincing evidence, I think, for dairy contributing to other things. So for example, people who have frequent upper respiratory tract infections and sinus infections, as dairy as something that can trigger that for people. Um, there are studies showing that kind of association, but studies showing that looking at that unique intervention of taking dairy out of the diet and seeing does a microbiome improve, I'm not aware of any of those studies just looking at dairy specifically. But certainly there's lots of evidence that people who are plant eaters versus people who are animal protein eaters, including dairy, that there are differences. And so for example, one of my favorite microbes is called F. prosnitzii, Fecalobacterium prosnitzii. And it is the most prevalent microbe in vegans who actually eat vegetables, not the Pop-Tart vegans. And F. prosnitzii is protective against heart disease, against diabetes, against colon cancer. So it's inversely associated with bad things happening. The higher the F. prosnitzii, the lower the likelihood of these different diseases. And you can't just go and borrow a vegan friend's F. prosnitzii because if you're not eating a plant-based diet that's high in fiber, your F. prosnitzii are just gonna die off. So this is the sort of thing we can look at in people who eat high animal product diet, including dairy, they have low F. prosnitzii. But I'm not aware, David, of the study looking at just dairy. And I think there are probably some studies showing short-term but I think you'd really have to look longitudinally because it's not just how much bifidobacterium you have or how much you know, lactobacillus, it's really what that association is with the disease. That's what we're really interested in. We're really interested in what is the correlation between having dairy or not having dairy and developing heart disease, colitis, et cetera. And, and I'm not aware of that, but you know, I've, I'll, I'll go check on it. I'll look it up now that you've mentioned it. Very cool, thanks. So a lot of people are asking, so what is the best thing to eat for our microbiome and also for the skin? Because we're talking also about skin a little bit today. Yeah, that one, there's no debate about that. It's plant fiber. It is absolutely an unprocessed plant fiber. So not, you know, the pea protein powder or whatever in a canister, but actual peas. So it is vegetables, ideally biodynamically grown vegetables that are grown in that cycle where the animals are fertilizing them because that's really enhancing the microbial composition. But anything locally grown, ideally not flown, you know, 3000 miles on a plane from Chile, locally grown, grown in good dirt, 
They don't necessarily have to be organic because there's a lot of factory organic where things are grown in a factory and they're still using pesticides, but they're organic pesticides. So I'll take locally grown in good dirt at the farmer's market that I go to in DC. There's a farm that we buy from and they're a small family farm. They're only a few acres and they're like, look, we, we really just can't afford to get that organic certification. But I assure you, we're not using any of that stuff on our produce. And I want to see the dirt on it. I want to see those carrots that look kind of gnarly and different. You know, when I go into the supermarket and I see a bag of carrots and each carrot is 6.2 inches and perfectly orange, I'm really scared by that. I want to see a gnarly looking, you know, one carrot that's just a little knob and the other one's longer and they're dirty and they're funny looking. That's how they're supposed to look. Yeah, and you know, carrots used carrots didn't always carrots weren't always orange. They used to be purple, and then the Dutch hybridized them. Purple carrots are the best. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Um, food, food plants grown in actual soil in dirt, because your plant is only as good as the soil that it's grown in. If your plant, if your food isn't grown in microbially rich soil, if it's grown in some factory somewhere, and the soil is not microbially rich the plant itself is not gonna have the same microbial punch. Right. There's a question if SIBO can cause rosacea. Absolutely, so SIBO, and for those of you who may not know what that is, it's small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is strongly correlated with rosacea. And that's because, again, when you think of the etiology of some of these conditions, people often develop SIBO because they've been on multiple courses of antibiotics. A common situation would be somebody who's been treated with doxycycline for acne, which is just a travesty that that's still going on. And so you kill off a lot of the gut bacteria, but you also change the skin bacteria. And then lo and behold, you have fungal overgrowth, you have lack of sufficient healthy species and you end up with rosacea. So there's a strong association. And as I said, I'm a little bit of a frustrated dermatologist on the side. So with my SIBO patients, when they come in and they're like, oh, my gas is gone, my bloating is gone, I'm having regular bowel movements. I'm looking at their skin and I'm like, well, what's going on with the rosacea? And it's always really exciting when they tell me that their skin is better too. That's great. So Diane's asking what the names of your books are. I'll put them in the show notes, but it is Gut Bliss, The Microbiome Solution and The Bloat Cure, especially if you're just joining us. So this is a uh, this is an important question for Sharon because it drives me crazy when I'll post recipes on Instagram and then I'll see them on somebody else's Instagram and they'll make my recipe, but then they're adding stevia to it. It's like, ugh, you're kidding me, right? She says, can you address the effects of non or low caloric sweeteners like erythritol, xylitol, mannitol, yeah. and even stevia or stevia on the microbiome. Cause I heard it's yeah. not good. Terrible idea. So this is a thing. You cannot get something for nothing. You cannot get sweetness and no calories and not pay the price somewhere else. And the problem with these compounds is they're not absorbed proximally in the upper digestive tract. That's why they don't contribute any calories but they are then, they transfer down to the colon and that's why they're often gas producing. If you've ever eaten diabetic chocolate, I decided just to try it a decade or two ago, I ate like a whole container of this diabetic chocolate. And first of all, I look at the package and there was like, there's no way this can be good because it was like a big thing of chocolate. And it's like, oh, it's 20 calories. So right away I was suspicious. I had the worst gas ever because those poorly absorbed sugar alcohols the, as you said, the xylitol and the maltitol, et cetera, they end up getting fermented by gut bacteria, but they don't produce healthy short chain fatty acids like with the resistant starches. And they're absolutely terrible for the gut. They are destructive to the microbiome and there's tons of articles showing that. And it turns out they're a risk factor for diabetes because insulin doesn't get released in response to calories. Insulin gets released in response to sweetness. And if you've ever eaten these artificial sweeteners, they're plenty sweet. They're often sweeter than regular sugar. And so you get a big spike in insulin release from using these artificial sweeteners. I mean, to me, it's one of the biggest hoaxes that has ever been visited on people and especially the American public is thinking that these diet things are good for you. Terrible. I, I love that answer. Thank you so much. And from now on, when people ask, I'm just going to Tend them that clip because thank you so much. That is terrific. So a lot of people are asking about fermented foods and ocular migraines. They read that it could be a trigger. I haven't heard that. I don't know if you have either. Yeah, I, I'm not aware of that. That's an interesting association. 
And so they're asking, Judy says, like, how much sauerkraut should we be eating each day? Oh, I don't think you can overdose on sauerkraut, but for people, for my patients who aren't fond of fermented foods, I usually tell people, you know, just a couple of tablespoons will give you the health benefit. So if you like it, you know, by all means go for it, but generally two or three tablespoons a day will do it in terms of really trying to add healthy bacteria. And there's so many different types of fermented foods. If you don't like one, try another, because there's one company called, I think it's Healing Movement that they sell at Whole Foods. And it comes in flavors like beet and carrot and caraway and spicy. So there's, there's different options. Yeah, there's so we have in, in uh, my second book, The Microbiome Solution, we've got a couple easy, there's a good uh, green apple and cabbage kraut. And some of those recipes we got from somebody else with the same publisher was Jeff Cox, his book, The Essential Book of Fermentation. Now that book has a ton of like cheese and alcohol and other things that aren't so good for the microbiome in there too. But he's got some great fermented food recipes in terms of like things with apples and cabbage and things like that that are pretty, pretty easy to do. All right, let's see. Great. Let me see. These, uh, what I'm seeing, the speed goes very, very quickly. So uh, Caroline says, are probiotics worth the money? It's, um, let me put it this way, Caroline, I don't take a probiotic and I don't take a probiotic because in my practice and through the research I've done, I believe that the importance of a whole food plant-based diet. And for those of you who are not fully plant-based, you don't have to be, you can still get incredible benefits from increasing the amount of plant fiber that you're eating, that that is way more important. Now there are specific conditions. So for example, one of my areas of expertise is inflammatory bowel disease, Crohn's disease and ulcerative colitis. And for those two conditions, we have good data that a particular high dose probiotic, very high levels, the one we use each packet has 900 billion colony forming units and we'll use up to four packets of those a day. And that's been well studied. So in some of the studies, again, from Italy, that dose of probiotic of that specific type that has these eight different species in it has been shown to be equivalent to some of the prescription medication. There was a really exciting study from Rome that came out a couple months ago, looking at 70 hospitalized patients who were hospitalized with SARS-CoV-2, sick COVID patients, and they divided them into a group of regular therapy, which at the time included some antivirals and different things. And then their standard therapy plus super high dose probiotic, nothing that's commercially available. I think it was uh, 3000 billion. I can't even do the math, but a super high dose of, again, the specific strain with specific types of lactobacillus bifido, et cetera. And they found that in the group that got the high probiotic therapy, nobody went on to be intubated, nobody went on to a ventilator and everybody survived. So they noticed a significantly different, better outcomes for the group that got the high dose probiotics. But again, what I wanna stress here is this is not the kind of probiotic that you can go to Whole Foods or you know, CVS or even get online. And you know, my criticism of the industry is that it's sort of the wild west. It's an unregulated industry. There's a lot of money spent on marketing. I do think that specific bacteria can and will and should have a role in specific illnesses, but right now it's not a very prescriptive approach. It's like, well, my yoga instructor said to try this. And um, you know, my concern is that it kind of takes the eyes off the prize, which is people think, oh, I'm taking a probiotic, so I'm good. The way people will take a vitamin and eat junk food and think yeah. I'm nutritionally replete because I'm eating a vitamin. And HJ, you and I know that the actual food is really the most important thing on the plate. So- Absolutely. Or they'll take the GI medicine so they can eat the food that gives them the heartburn. And I was thinking about this just to kind of continue the tennis motif. I was thinking, I was watching these tennis players out there and I was thinking, you know, tennis is simple. You have this racket and you have a ball and you have to hit it over the net. It's simple but it's hard. It's not complicated, but it's still hard. And so I think the same thing of health. Health is simple, but it's hard because it's hard to make those choices day in, day out and be consistent and do those things. It's hard to get up in the morning and go get exercise. It's hard to eat a salad when you really want to eat nachos. You know, it's hard to do those things, but it's just that consistency. You know, these tennis players get out there and they train and they just day in, day out, they hit the ball over the net. 
And I think the same is true for us. Like just put yourself into a little bit of training. I told a patient of mine yesterday who has diverticulosis and he's a big meat and potatoes eater. And I said to him, I just want you to eat a salad every day at lunchtime. If you don't have it at home, line it up on the sweet green app or whatever to get delivered. Do you know, this is somebody who has resources. I said, I don't care what else you're doing. I don't care about your bourbon at night. I just want you to get in one salad every day at lunchtime. And it's going to make a big difference. It's funny. People are just so adverse to eating vegetables when they're so good for you on so many ways. But some of the palate thing, AJ, I mean, you know that you're yeah. a chef and you know that people, we get so sucked into the sweet, right? And people reject the savory. So I'm just curious, like, what are your tips? What do you tell people in terms of developing a palate for vegetables? <laughs> you know, believe it or not, one of the things that helps is uh, I've interviewed this doctor many times is water fasting at the True North Health Center, because once that is the ultimate palate cleanse and the ultimate reboot, because then when we refeed them, because I've worked there for 10 years, you give them steamed zucchini, they think they're eating a hot fudge sundae. Yeah. And that's the quickest way. Yeah, it is hard to neuroadapt, especially if you've been eating sugar, fat, and salt your whole life. I was one of those Pop-Tart vegans, but I was actually the Coke Slurpee vegan. So for 43 years, 26 years, I was was obese, 2,200 pounds, and a very unhealthy vegan with precancerous polyps. So it's not about being vegan. It's about eating plants, whole plants. And I'm glad you mentioned fasting because there's tons of data showing the benefits of fasting on the microbiome that, that, and, and just as, you know, I, my, I was typically had a pretty strict intermittent fasting regimen on Mondays and Thursdays for 24 hours. So from Sunday night to Monday night and from Wednesday night to Thursday night, they're my two busiest days at work. And I found that it just really helped me focus and concentrate. And I was really grateful for the food when it, when it arrived, uh, when I got home, but the pandemic has sort of messed that all up because, you know, the days all run into each other. And I have to say, I really, I miss it. I miss yeah. having my week sort of, you know, at the end of the weekend, you start with that fast on a Monday and then get ready for the weekend on a Thursday. So I need to get back to that. Yeah. Stephanie has an interesting question on poop. She says, do you know of any science or studies that shows how often you go correlates to better gut health and health overall? Because there, there seems to be this this idea that normal is what's normal for you. But when we look at indigenous cultures or even pets, it's not normal to go like once or twice a week. Absolutely. It is not normal at all, but it is a reflection of the standard American diet, the SAD diet. So doctors will tell you, oh, you only go every three days. That's fine. It's not fine. You eat every day. You need to eliminate every day, at least once a day. And Stephanie, what you probably found if you're a plant eater is if you start really eating a lot of plants, and especially if you're also doing a lot of legumes and things, you will have more than one bowel movement. And a lot of it is also to, you can have the opposite. There can be people who go multiple times a day, but it's incomplete. It's little rabbit pellets, you know, little Western stool, and they're never really fully emptying. So it is absolutely at least once a day really is the ideal. And if you're not eliminating once a day, assuming you're eating at least once a day, then you really need to investigate whether it's the diet, whether it's something anatomical, whether it's something in the medicine cabinet, Uh, Are you not having enough water? Are you spending too much time sitting and it's not, you know, you're not moving around enough to stimulate peristalsis, but, but really what is holding that back? And the reason that's really important is when you think about it, stool is waste matter. And even though I think it's like fascinating and I'm always like looking at it and wanting to take pictures and like show my family members, oh, look at this fantastic log. I understand that people don't share my fascination and appreciation for it. I think we can all agree that stool is meant to be outside of the body. And what I tell people is imagine if you took, you know, a pound or two of stool and you wrapped it up and you stuffed it under your shirt and you walked around with it for, you know, four days. Like, how would that feel? It's supposed to be eliminated. And we also know when we look at the colon cancer data, we see a strong correlation between chronic constipation and colon cancer. Because when you have that stool that's stuck in your colon and it's not eliminated, those toxins that are being eliminated by your body that are in the stool are now in close contact with the lining of the colon for days and days and days and days. And that's a really bad idea. So it's more than just, well, I feel better having a bowel moon every day. You know, it's really a health imperative to detoxify your body that way. 
Yeah, that's why they call it waste material, not save material. <laughs> Sharon, who's, Sharon, you have the best question. She says, what should you do if you cannot digest beans or legumes? Some people say that even the smallest amounts cause them so much gastric distress. Everybody, to some extent, will have a little bit of gas with that. And, you know, one of the fun things in our household is seeing like who has the worst smellier gas after my husband makes his delicious curry lentils. It's usually me. And so part of why that is, is because those foods have a high degree of indigestible carbohydrate in them, the raffinose we talked about before. And it's indigestible on purpose because that is meant to feed our gut bacteria. That's what our gut bacteria take and ferment and turn into short chain fatty acids. And part of that process is also production of hydrogen and methane gas, et cetera. You can use, um, there is an enzyme alpha one galactosidase and there's a vegan form and there's a one that's not vegan. That enzyme that will help to break down those foods but soaking them before you cook them helps. Adding a sea vegetable like kombu helps. Making sure you're not eating canned versions helps. So those are all things that can help to cut down on the amount of raffinose. And then some are worse than others, like lentils are typically a little bit better tolerated than for example, black beans. But I usually will recommend to my patients to try not to cut them out completely because that's what I call good gas versus you know bad gas, like a lactose intolerance gas. It's just, just part of the digestive process. Wow, it's so fun talking to you. I could talk to you all day and maybe you'll come back sometime. You know, you'd ask me about Bailey. She's not in the room, but this is what she looks like. I know. Oh, isn't she cute? Oh, she's adorable. Yeah. How is she? She's going to be nine this month on September 26th. And I want to thank Susan Johnson for this wonderful picture. But yeah, I'm so glad you gave dogs the thumbs up. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I love that. Dirt, sweat, veg. That's really like, all we have to do. Thank you so much. It's been so, it's really been, it's just such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you for the great work you do and for the passion of the work. It's just, it's just inspiring to just talk poop with you. <laughs> Thanks, Chef AJ. Well, right back at you because really the work that you're doing and really sort of inspiring, encouraging people to appreciate the importance of what they put on their plate and what they put on their mouth and into their bodies. There's no more important work in the health field. So thank you for yeah. all that you do. And well, thank you for the acknowledgement because what I'm learning from all the GI doctors is that our health begins in the gut and that starts with what we eat. What we eat matters. Yeah. Absolutely. And what we need to eat is mostly plants or exclusively plants if you like, but you gotta eat them. Well, you know, I always say Michael Pollan and his seven words summed it up, right? Eat food, not too much, mostly plants. And I, I think I improved on that a little bit with just eat more plants. Yeah. I have seven words like Michael Pollan, Michael Pollan, but mine is grow up and eat your damn vegetables. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to get that t-shirt. You don't have to like them. You just have to eat them. That's what I tell people. And they'll guess what? Once you eat them, you learn to love them. And especially, you, you know, people are saying, what do you do for your skin? Even that's what you do for beautiful skin is eat fruits and vegetables. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Dr. Chuck. Well, and thank thanks, you. Thanks, all, thanks all of you for watching another episode of Chef AJ Live. Please come back at 3 p.m. when I have a bonus show that I'm sure you're going to enjoy. Again, thanks again, Dr. Chuck. You're welcome. Thank you.